it's time to start cooking. I'm really excited to have all of you here today and to be a part of this. There are uh, three points that I would really hope that everybody comes away with today, and that is that there are healthy foods which can heal the patients long term, help them feel better while they're on their medical regimen, de depending upon which stage they're in, and then that these are easy type recipes and give you some suggestions to give people to help fit them into your lifestyle. So the first thing I'd like to point out well, like, before I get started is uh, this is a little booklet that we made and it's packed with lots of really good information in there. And I'm going to walk through and just go over. In addition to the recipes which we have, it talks a little bit about the Hormone Health Network and what they do. There are also a list of ingredients here and foods that work for different issues. So we have a list of foods that work for balancing glucose. We have a list of foods that are anti-inflammatory. We have a list of foods also that are alkalizing and that help people to balance their pH levels. And then we've highlighted which ones are common to those lists. So people can look at this very quickly and know these are things I want to have in my diet every day. The other thing that we have over here are some different lifestyle challenges that people have been found that acromegaly to have and how we can combat them with food. So the first one talks about challenges with coordination. And again, the B vitamins are going to be really, really important for that. The B12, obviously they can get shots and they can get a little bit of injection, but they can also eat it in foods with legumes and berries and a lot of good ingredients. Uh, we also talk about uh, the frequent hunger, and that was something that Wayne mentioned and how frequent hunger just keeps coming up over and over again and, and people can't get satisfied. So we're going to talk about the best foods to satisfy people and how to go about eating them so that they will be satisfied with smaller amounts. We also have some ergonomic solutions. People tend to have joint problems, carpal tunnel syndrome, and it's difficult when you eat, when you're working with a knife and you're preparing food, how to do this. Sometimes just lifting the fork up can be challenging. So we minimize that in all of these recipes, and I'll be talking about those type of things. And also on this page, we have um, the belly busting ingredients. We go over them again. How to coordinate a proper meal, which is really, really important. Some meal planning tips which I'm going to go over with you as well. Pantry building, cooking and serving, planning ahead, eating out, resources, and then all of the recipes themselves. So the first recipe I'd like to get started with is our salmon recipe. And these are the spice dusted wild salmon fillets with lemon dipping sauce. And this is the one that we were just talking about. The first thing that we have to do is make our spice mix. I came up with an anti-inflammatory spice mix a couple years ago. And the reason why I did it is because my doctor, who's our internist, who's also uh, award-winning, has a long background in nutrition and in longevity, and practices with an integrative approach, prescribed for my husband a supplement uh, called an anti-inflammatory supplement. So I turned it around, and I looked at it, and it was all spices. And I said, of course, this is a no-brainer. You know, These spices are anti-inflammatory. I wonder how they taste together. Now, some of these spices are already present in a lot of Middle Eastern and Indian spice concoctions anyway, so they're not completely foreign to people. They taste great, and we can make our own spice mix at home and then use it on all kinds of things. So these are the ingredients that we're going to talk about today. The first one over here is cinnamon. Everybody loves cinnamon. I mean, how hard is it to get cinnamon? All I recommend is to get pure cinnamon and not uh, a lot what's available almost everywhere, which is a mixture of cassia and cinnamon. Cassia is a bark different from cinnamon, and it has different properties. Cinnamon itself helps to, when it's pure, can make your glucose levels even. It also has some anti-inflammatory properties. But the cassia has a laxative effect, and that's what most American cinnamon is. So you don't really want to want to have that for the acromegaly patients. You want to have pure cinnamon. And then you also want to have turmeric. Turmeric, if you're used to uh, Mexican food, Indian food, you'll be familiar with turmeric. Turmeric has anti-inflammatory properties. It also has antiseptic properties. People use it to treat bug bites. They use it to prevent them from sun, uh, uh, sun damage in India a lot. It colors food a beautiful yellow color. It's also anti-inflammatory, so we're going to use that. The third spice is ginger, ground dried ginger root. Fresh ginger is also great, but the ground dried root is really important. Anti-inflammatory. Anybody has an upset stomach, drink a teaspoon of this in a tea or drink a ginger tea, and it's going to calm you right away. And then the next thing that we have here is some crushed red chilies. Red chilies really help with digestion and can be have an anti-inflammatory effect on, on as well. And then another spice that 
we take for granted often is salt. For people who are dealing with acromegaly or other illnesses or who are reducing their salt, I recommend an unrefined sea salt. And the reason for that is this will prevent the bloating and the water retention that goes around with a lot of other commercially produced salts. And it's a really good tasting salt. It has other good mineral properties in it if it's unrefined. So even though you're getting a little bit of sodium, but you're getting a lot of other benefits. And today we're going to talk about how people can get kind of more bang for their buck with nutrition. You know, if you're going to eat those 350 calories anyway, why not eat the best 350 calories that can make you feel good today, set you up for more health in the future, at the same time. So to make the spice mix, the first thing I'm going to do is take about a quarter of a cup of cinnamon. I'm just going to put it right into my spice jar. And then I'm going to add in the turmeric. And the ginger. And a, just a little bit. We just need a teaspoon or half a teaspoon of the ground chilies. You can use it to your taste preference. And the salt will keep out and add to our food only when we need it. Now, I keep talking about anti-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory, and, and some people don't know why anti-inflammatory is important. Inflammation is present in everybody who's sick and who's got illnesses. So obviously they're having an issue with inflammation or they, their body wouldn't be in a disease state anyway. So if we can get them really hooked on a lot of these anti-inflammatory foods, and this is something that Dr. Whale has made really popular, then we can get their body back into as close of a normalized state as popular. So I'm just shaking this up. Again, if you like uh, rasa hanout, the Moroccan spice mix, this is present in a lot of those. And these are spices that are very, very common in India and in the Middle East. And the, the combination of sweet and savory is going to give your food a lot of flavor. Now today we're using this on our salmon, but I love it on sweet potatoes, sweet potato fries. A little bit of this gives them a great flavor. You can use it on kebabs, you can use it on chicken, any kind of fish, uh, any vegetable. And people were talking about they don't have a lot of time, they've got to get things in the oven. Throw some raw vegetables on a baking sheet, top them with a little bit of olive oil in this. You've got a great side dish, it lasts in your refrigerator for a week, it tastes good, and it's going to give you a lot of nutrients. So that's it. So that's our easy spice mix. Now I'm going to come over here and start with the salmon. So this is my piece of salmon. We want to use wild salmon. Salmon is perfect for people with acromegaly. It's perfect for people who are trying to eat healthful anyway. But the reason why it's so perfect for this illness is because it has a lot of B vitamins in it. It's also rich in omega-3s and fatty acids. And it has a lot of the DHA in it, which is we naturally produce in our brains anyway. So people are dealing with issues like brain fog, like memory, uh, not feeling well, and depression. That extra DHA is really going to give them a boost and help to literally boost their brain power. People should eat be feel better immediately after they eat this. So that's a nice bonus. The other thing is, because it's such a nice quality, lean, high protein food with about 33 grams of protein per serving in this recipe, that means that they're going to stay full longer. And uh, people in this room probably understand, but a lot of patients might not understand the importance of good quality proteins. When you've got a good quality protein, I always use the analogy for my students or for my audience of a, a log that's burning in a fireplace. If you've got that log and it's burning and you're feeding it with good quality protein, it's going to keep burning at a steady level for longer at an even even temperature. But if you're throwing things at it that are less quality, the, the light goes out, the, the fire goes out more quickly, and it, they, it doesn't stay going as long. So this is what we want with people with acromegaly. We want them to stay satisfied, we want them to stay hungry longer, and we want to give them that boost of energy that's going to keep them going because their body's dealing with a lot of change. So regardless where they are, pre-surgery, post-surgery, this salmon is good, and it tastes good enough that everybody in their family will eat it. So even if the family's not sick, they're not going to mind eating this delicious recipe. And this is also fun to make. It's got beautiful colors, which are important for the sensory benefit that we talked about. So the first thing I'm going to do is make a little bit of a lemon bath. And this is kind of like a vinaigrette. That's all I'm doing. I'm just squeezing out my lemon juice here. And then I'm going to whisk in some olive oil. Olive oil is really great because, of, again, all of the healthful fats that it has. 
And when you have a little bit of olive oil, it helps your body to absorb the other nutrients better. So it's going to get, it's going to double up on the healthy fat in the salmon. It's going to help our spices adhere. And then it's going to help us to get the benefits of those spices once we eat them. So I'm just going to take my salmon and then drag it along right through here. Just dragging it through the olive oil. And then you would put it into your pan, if you're making it, with the skin side down. And then we're ready to top it with our spice mixture. So we can come over here and just take a teaspoon of our spice mixture. Okay, that's a little bit more than a teaspoon. But we've got our fork, so we'll just push that off. That's what I get for trying to skimp on the utensils. So this is what we end up with, something that just has a nice coating of the spice on it. Now this goes into an oven at 400, 425 degrees for eight minutes, and it's done. That's how easy it was. Uh, when it comes out, it looks like this. This is one I did this morning when I was prepping. So eight minutes in the oven, and two seconds of prep work, because you're going to have this spice made in a huge quantity that you can use whenever you want in your fridge. And that's how it looks. And then we're going to take it and top it on our bed of greens, because what's a better accompaniment to salmon than a bed of greens? The greens are great because they're healthy. They've got a lot of iron in them. Iron's really, really important for the production of hemoglobin. So this is going to be important for people that are healing any type of illness, but especially post-surgery. It also is visually very appealing because it looks like you're getting a lot of food. And you could eat a cup of greens for about 30 calories. So not a lot at all. So I'm just going to put my salmon right on the top. Now this is uh, less than a quantity for four people. There would actually be uh, more greens, I didn't put them all on the plate because it didn't look so nice, if we were serving four people. So this is quite a bit. As you can see, it's going to fill people up really, really well. Let me get a spatula. These have a lot of flavor also, not only from the salmon. So this is three pieces, but our fourth piece would be done, and this would give us enough for a family of four. And then we have our dipping sauce. So in the dipping sauce, I have Greek-style yogurt, and it's been sitting out for a minute, so you can see the extra juice here. I recommend to people when they're eating, if they want to have plain yogurt, a low-fat yogurt, and, and make it into a Greek style, you can put it over a colander and let it sit overnight in the fridge. It's going to thicken up. But real Greek, Greek yogurt, is important to know the difference, is that usually real Greek yogurt is that it's made with a combination of sheep's milk and goat's milk. Goat's milk and sheep's milk both are more healthy for us than cow milk. But if you have to use cow milk, this is still good because it has, yogurt has inulin in it. And the ingredient inulin helps, has been proven to help the blood glucose level remain even. So anybody who has glucose issues, people with acromegaly do in a lot of different stages, this is good for them. Yogurt also has a lot of probiotics. If you do drain your own yogurt and you end up with this extra little excess water in the bottom of the bowl, don't throw that away. You should actually drink it because that's where the most of the pro probiotics end up. So don't throw away that extra little liquid. So this is going to be the base for my sauce, which I'm making to go for the salmon. This is our dipping sauce. And you can see three cups. We're dividing it by four. So everybody gets about three quarters of a cup of this dipping sauce. It's going to help to fill them up. It's going to give them those uh, blood glucose leveling properties. And it's going to taste really good and give you that nice creamy mouth feel of something like a you know, more fattening sauce. But instead, it's healthy for you. So stirring this up. And then I'm going to zest my lemon. Now, people with acromegaly have been known to have a lot of issues with uh, mood disorders, and, and the hormones can kind of really play havoc on your mood. One of the best natural things for elevating mood is citrus oil. You can buy at Whole Foods or at any of the, the healthy stores. You can get uh, citrus oil bergamot that comes from southern Italy, or you can buy orange or lemon. And these are known to be mood enhancers. You can just put a little bit of an oil burner in the home and burn it. But if you want to do it naturally, zest a lemon. The smell or an orange or a grapefruit is going to really, really do a lot to wake you up. It also smells great. 
So I'm just zesting this way, and I can smell it from here. Um, very, very mood enhancing. So it's, um, you know, two seconds of work, but it's something good that people, if you, they have this illness, it would be good for them to do. It also adds flavor. It adds the uh, vitamin C from the lemon oil, because all of the oils are found right here in the skin, and it just tastes great. Uh, you can, usually it remains here, so you want to just tap it like this, and you get the excess off. So I'm going to stir that up. And then my third ingredient, no one's actually eating this food, so don't worry about, the, about our friends here on stage. Um, the next ingredient is baby dill. Baby dill is really, really important for anybody watching sodium, uh, that intake. Baby dill has tons of mineral salts, so it gives you that salty flavor, the feel that you want, plus it gives you the benefit of all the minerals, but it doesn't have any sodium in it. So anybody watching sodium, I tell them, if you, especially if they like it, most people do like dill, it smells so great, it tastes great, use a lot of dill in your food. Use it on your vegetables, use it in your rice, use it wherever you want. It's going to give you more flavor, more nutrition, and no salt. And salmon and dill are a classic combination. In Central Asia, they use a lot of these huge copious amounts of herbs, Azerbaijan and Iran, and it was cooking this type of cuisine that I really became used to this. And people, believe it or not, live to be very, very long. They, in Azerbaijan, for example, they have the highest amount of centarians of any other country. And that's, uh, I think, in part because of their, their herb usage. So we're stirring that up. And then the last ingredient is garlic. And I don't have to tell you how great garlic is. It's a natural antibiotic. Um, it does a lot of wonderful things for the body, for healing. So we have two cu cubes in here. You really don't notice them at all if people don't like garlic. But if they do like garlic, you know, it's there. And you do notice the health benefits if you eat garlic consistently over time. I'm going to stir this up. Now, people have the ergonomic issues. They have, I mentioned the joint issues and sometimes carpal tunnel. So they're not going to be want to be chopping a lot of garlic. They've got those great garlic presses right now that's perfect for somebody with acromegaly to use in the kitchen. So here we have our yogurt dip. And we have our salmon and we have our greens. We can drizzle a little more olive oil, a little bit more lemon on the greens. This, per serving, is 350 calories. 350 calories are what muffins have at your local coffee shop. So you could have a muffin, or you could have uh, a third of this and a third of this. And I think you know, you're, gonna be, you're gonna have great benefits with this, it's gonna taste great, everyone likes it, and it's versatile. When you're making that salmon, make a whole side of salmon. You can freeze some, you can keep some in your fridge for a couple days later. You can cube it up and put it in a rice, brown rice tortilla and bring it to work with some greens as a wrap. You can do so many things with it. It doesn't even have to be just salmon. You could do chicken the same way. You could do turkey the same way, thighs, breast, whatever you want. You could do any kind of fish the same way. So a lot of flavors and a lot of different things. And also you can vary up the greens or you could saute the greens or you could serve them on a bed of peppers or a different vegetable or whatever you like. I just chose this because it was optimum, it was easy, and it was something that I know that everybody can get pretty much no matter where they live in, in the world. So that's this recipe. And now we're going to come on to our second recipe, which is a wonderful vegetarian main or a side course. And this is our quinoa tabbouleh with figs and lemon vinaigrette. And if you want to follow along in the recipe book, I can tell you which page we're on, page 10. So quinoa. Are any of you familiar with using quinoa? A couple, okay. So quinoa is an ancient grain. It's originally from South America. It's grown mostly in the Andes and in Bolivia. And it was very, very important to the Aztecs. It was so important to the Aztec culture that when the Spaniards took over and they outlawed the quinoa, the, the Aztec empire went down and lost power right away. Right away. This, they consider this to be the mother grain. And the reason why quinoa is so important is because it has all of the nine essential amino acids that make up a protein. Now, most of our plant-based proteins are incomplete. You have to mix them with other things, with beans, with the dairy, with whatever, to make them complete. But quinoa, you do not. Quinoa is a complete protein all by itself, no meat, no dairy, perfect for vegans, perfect for people like those suffering with acromegaly that want to really boost their protein intake and help you know, with, the, with the excess belly fat, with the additional energy, with feeling full longer. This is the perfect ingredient for them. It's super simple to eat, and it can be enjoyed breakfast, lunch, dinner, sweet, savory, in a bunch of different ways. I'm going to pass around this little bowl, because this shows the quinoa grain uh, when it comes out fresh. I'm going to pass it to you. If you don't mind, you can pass it down to the guests. Thank you. I should know better than to get close to the microphone. 
Now, in that box, in this box, you have about two cups of quinoa. That, that's what it comes with. And you prepare quinoa just like you do simple rice. Two cups of quinoa, you need four cups of water. You rinse the quinoa under the, in, in the sink, then you put it into the pot, and you cover it with four cups of water if you're using the whole box. And you get this. It's just this fluffy grain. It takes 10 minutes to cook covered. You can cook it in a huge batch, leave it in your refrigerator, it lasts all week, nothing's gonna happen to it. And it looks like this, it's just a nice fluffy grain. It has a little bit of a nutty flavor, but not a lot of flavor at all. You're gonna wanna use this as a base or in with something. You don't wanna just serve it plain, because plain, it's not gonna have a whole lot of flavor. So you can add it to soups, you can add it to stews, you can do whatever you want. What I like tell people, make it in a big batch. You can use some for your quick breakfast. Everybody, I'm so in a hurry, I don't have any time to make breakfast, I don't have energy to make breakfast, the kids don't have time for breakfast. This is a great warm cereal in the winter, cold cereal in the summer. Throw in some fruit, some berries, some nuts, whatever you like, a little bit of wheat germ, because the vitamin E is great for people with acromegaly to help with a lot of the different uh, emotional issues that they have going on and a lot of the different skin issues and joint issues. So. Uh, make some, put it for breakfast, and then make some and put it in salads and soups and stews like we're going to do. So this salad, I came up with it after seeing something similar in France. They were doing this in Paris. Are any of you familiar with tabbouleh? So tabbouleh is a little bit more well known. This is a popular Middle Eastern salad. You see it a lot of time in Lebanese restaurants. Tabbouleh is made with the cracked wheat grain from whole wheat, and usually tomatoes and cucumbers and a lot of parsley and uh, lemon juice, a kind of a lemon olive oil vinaigrette. That's the classic tabbouleh. What we're doing, instead of that wheat, we're using the quinoa, because the quinoa is the complete protein. And then instead of the tomatoes and the cucumbers, which are a little bit more ubiquitous, so you can get them anywhere, we're going to use figs to top off. So if you don't have fresh figs, you can use dried figs. They're even more healthy for you. But if you don't want to go the fig route, you can use berries or whatever you want. And these three ingredients are really, really perfect for post-surgery patients with acromegaly. I designed that, it with them in mind, although anybody in the world can eat it and enjoy it because it tastes great. But really post-surgery. And that's because all of these three ingredients have an alkalizing effect on the body. A lot of times people, when they're in a disease state, their acid levels and their pH balance is not normal, and the acid levels are higher. So by giving them more alkalizing foods and reducing the acidity, you're putting in them into a more healthful state. And the specific ingredients in this also help people to heal faster and really to promote new cell growth and things like that. Arugula has a lot of iron in it. It's very, very alkalizing. And again, no fat, no calories. You know, a cup has about 30. So you can, you can eat that in large, large quantities. And it tastes great. It's got that nice peppery flavor. And then we also have here the quinoa, which is also high in iron. And that's needed to pr promote the hemoglobin helps bodies to heal, helps make more energy in the body. It's got copper, which helps fight off infections. So we need that after disease. So we can put that right on here. And actually, I think I'm just going to pour it right on. And then we have our figs. Now, ounce per ounce, figs have more nutritious values in them, more nutritional properties in them. They have a lot of vitamins, minerals, nutrients than any other fruit. So they're really, really good for you. And if you eat dried, the, the properties are even more concentrated than the fresh. So fresh are delicious, they look beautiful, they have that wonderful texture and mouthfeel. I definitely recommend eating them when you can get them. But when you can't, don't feel bad about using dried in this salad because they still are very, very good for you. and you get a little bit of acid from them and that the beautiful mouthfeel is really nice. Arugula is rich in those vitamin uh, Bs and a lot of different varieties like uh, Dr. Nuktagal mentioned to us, how important they were. You know, B1, really good for brain power, for memory, for the, the stress uh, response. B12, good for pain. A lot of people with acromegaly mention having lots of pain, not being able to get out of bed some days. So the B vitamins are really, really helpful for that. So now I'm going to make my vinaigrette, and this is just a classic vinaigrette. Any, anyone who, who wants to be in the kitchen um, to have a good vinaigrette up your sleeve is great because you can bathe the proteins in it. You can also drizzle it on salads, and it's healthy, and it's so much better than using a commercial salad dressing with a lot of different additives in it. So to make the vinaigrette, 
I always start with the acid, and that could be uh, vinegar or a citrus juice or whatever you like. Keep in mind that even though lemon uh, is acidic, it has that acidic flavor, it, all, it actually has an alkalizing effect on the body. So it's very, very healthy. That lemon water is great uh, soother, alkalizer. People uh, with illnesses should be using it a lot. Lime is also the same way. And it gives us a lot of flavor. And if people don't like lemon juice and don't have access to it, they want to use apple cider vinegar. Apple cider vinegar is also a great healthy alternative. We're just going to whisk in a little bit of olive oil here. And you can use more if you like. You can mash up an avocado in here for some creaminess. You could put more citrus juice. You can really, uh, the sky's the limit with this. And you just want to stir them until they kind of become even. And I'm going to give it a little bit of salt and pepper. I've got some freshly ground pepper here. And then my salt. This is the unrefined sea salt. And I brought the bag here so you guys can see it. This is the one that I'm using. So this prevents the bloat. Uh, it has a lot of mineral salts in it. And it's, it's unrefined. It has a little bit less of sodium content than a regular table salt. So you get, you, again, you get more bang for your buck with this. And I'll pass it around so we can look at it. So now we can just drizzle this right on the salad. And you can serve it. You can stir it up and serve it that way. I think it tastes best when you serve it stirred up, but it looks the best this way. And to serve this salad, what I would do is make a huge quantity like this, even if it was just for me, and leave it in the refrigerator, because this is going to last like that for at least three days. It's a great snack in a smaller portion. It's a great uh, vegetarian main, and it's a great side co course. And again, you can see the recipes in this. Uh, the ingredients in this uh, are such that this is a serving for four. So if I divided this into four, that's my serving. That has 320 calories in it. So that's less than the blueberry muffin at your coffee shop. You get a complete protein. You get all the iron. You get all these healthy things. And you saw how easy that was to cook up. So I'm going to set that over here. Now, leftover quinoa, if you've got any, again, remember, the next morning's breakfast or th throw it into any other soup or stew, uh, serve it with beans, uh, wrap it up in a wrap for lunch the next day. There's a lot of good things you can do with this, and it's only a couple dollars, so it's really inexpensive. You know, a lot of the resistance we get from eating healthy for people is the price. And there's this great little ad that's going around Facebook now. I don't know if anybody's seen it, but it shows you know, a fast food restaurant and like a meal and how much it costs, and then it shows a really healthy meal and how much it costs. And this, these things are actually very, very economical, it's not even to mention the benefits that you're getting from them. So it's important for, for people to remember that. So now we can go on into our salad. And this one, I'm going to come over here and do this one. Again, I apologize for the pest, but we're not eating this, so don't worry. Spinach. Spinach is really important because of all the iron in it. Uh, all of the chlorophyll is present. really helps people to detoxify. So anybody who is having any kind of health issues at all, spinach is important for them, unless they're on a medicine which prohibits it. But I don't believe that people with acromegaly usually are, so we're safe. And what we're going to do with this salad is um, we're going to combine it with mangoes and avocados. Now, these are really important because uh, Avocados and mangoes have a lot of potassium, and that's really important to, for converting glucose into energy. So again, because people with acromegaly are dealing with some glucose issues and some uh, similar diabetes-type symptoms, converting glucose into energy is good. All three of these ingredients are um, alkalizing. So again, they have that high acidic state from being sick, and you give them three alkalizing things, very, very good. And best of all, it just tastes great. This is a delicious salad. I don't know of anybody who would turn their nose up at this salad. So we've got our spinach ready to go. Now, this spinach was $1.50. So I know people like, you know, vegetables are expensive, produce are expensive. $1.50 for all this, for four people. So not expensive at all. And I've got my mango. If you don't like mango, you know, people don't like mango, they can obviously use whatever fruit they want. Some of the ones that are really, really good for people are um, apples. They could use those as well. And berries, blueberries, would taste good. And then I've got my avocado, which is starting to oxidize a little bit. I rubbed it with some lemon juice 
so that it would stay fresh for us. But avocados are also really rich in healthy fats. And someone can eat about a quarter, even if they were watching their weight, and still do well. They get the health benefit, but they don't have to worry about um, calories because it is a good source of fat. And it's important to remember that the avocados are good for managing glucose levels, for lowering blood sugar, and for lowering cholesterol. A lot of people are worried about them and they think that they can't eat them. I usually tell people it's because you're used to dipping them into nacho chips and it's the nachos that you can't eat. You can also do this salad with cilantro. Cilantro is really, really important. Both Parsley and cilantro have a lot of detoxifying effects. Some people wake up in the morning and they drink a juice that they just put the cilantro with a little bit of water or the parsley with a little bit of water into a juicer and they drink that first thing for its detoxification. Uh, it's got a lot of vitamin C in it and cilantro is also really good for evening out glucose levels. So people like cilantro, use a ton of it. You can use the leaves, it's inexpensive and you can mix it right in with everything. Now I'm going to make my dressing, again, the same kind of boring way that I made the other ones, but it tastes great, it's healthy, it works. So I've got our citrus in here. Now this only has 305 per serving. So again, we're, go we're going progressively less as we deal with in the amount of calories that are in these recipes. But you can see they're all filling. So that's our spinach, avocado, and mango salad. So just to review, this is a nice, complete meal for someone with uh, acromegaly, or they could be spaced out and eaten at different times, uh, different occasions. I want to talk a little bit about how we could change up these recipes. We talked about changing the salmon with other proteins and the greens. We talked about how you could do it in one day, make a whole bunch of things at one time, and then freeze or keep it in the refrigerator for the whole week. Uh, we have our dipping sauce, which works great with crudite and can use other things, even it doesn't have to be just with the salmon. And then we have our salad here, which the quinoa, if we have any extra, we make extra, we can use that for breakfast in the day. We can change that salad up, we can serve it hot or cold. And then this salad also, you could add different berries, and I would add nuts if you were replacing the avocados, because almonds are really good for uh, people with acromegaly, so we could use the almonds, use a berry, uh, switch it up for a different green, and still have something that's, that's very, very good. Now, I want to talk about some of the other recipes in the book which we didn't get a chance to do today, because we had to choose, and we had to do ones that would be you know, fitting into our time slot and be fun, but there are a lot of other ones. Uh, there's a Moroccan shermoula style fish, here at the convention center, they're actually selling this recipe, but they're doing it with chicken instead of the fish. So you can try it out. Very, very easy. It uses our spice mix. It uses a lot of cilantro. Very easy. Just as easy as the salmon, but a different flavor profile. We've also got the southern Italian beans and greens. This is a wonderful recipe. It's got uh, dandelion greens in it, which are more and more popular. You could use kale if you don't want to use dandelion greens. And some chickpeas that are cooked and made into a puree. This is a perfect, perfect recipe for people with acromegaly because it's got tons of fiber in it, low fat, it's very filling, and it tastes great. Another recipe that we have is our DIY multigrain sandwich bread. It's really hard to get good quality whole grain breads that you can be sure what's in them. And people with an illness is serious and having so many symptoms as this one, they want to make sure that they're eating quality grains. So this is a quality grain that people can eat in a small quantity, get fiber, get their kind of bread fix, but not get any of the other additives or uh, corn syrup or any other nonsense that we don't want in our breads. Then I have some drinks that are really good soothers for people. We have uh, the Moroccan mint tea. Mint has a lot of vitamins in it. Green tea has actually been known to prevent the absorption of fat in the body. So people that are dealing with uh, excess fat and, and not being able to deal with, uh, for example, the belly issue like patients of acromegaly are, green tea is something they should be drinking often, in addition to the antioxidant properties that everybody already knows about. The next one is our cinnamon and ginger smoother. Just like we've got the cinnamon and ginger in our anti-inflammatory spice mix, we can drink it uh, to get that extra therapeutic event at the end of a meal. And you can even mix it with milk to make kind of a chai in the morning. It's a lovely alternative, healthful alternative to a cafe latte or something like that. 
So I'm done preparing the recipes, and I wondered if anybody had any questions um, about any of the recipes or about uh, the acromegaly diet that would be help people in different situations. Any questions at all? Okay, good. If you didn't stand up, I would feel bad. <laughs> This, this may be kind of an odd question, but sure. a lot of our patients, you know, are on Medicaid or they don't have a lot of resources. Can you give like a rough, rough estimate of what the cost, not so much of the time to shop, but the cost of the ingredients for this kind of a meal as opposed to what most people are eating? You know, it's, that's very, very hard to, to, to define when you talk about in place of what people are eating because uh, people have a really weird, and this is a very psychological benefit, people have a weird idea of what they're already eating at home and they have a weird idea, you know, people also don't count foods that are bad for them. They just kind of like do it and it, it goes by the wayside like a, like a splurge purchase or something that they don't really register in their mind. But when they're eating healthily, then they're like looking at the bill like, oh, I paid $100 on groceries. It's like, yeah, but you paid $500 on restaurants that didn't have healthy food for you. And, and people don't really manage it. So it's actually more, eco more economical for people to eat this way because you can come across with a, you know, a meal for a family of four that's like between four and eight dollars. Where can you eat out, even a fast food restaurant, that you can get a, a meal that's gonna feed four people for eight dollars, you can't. So, um, but that that takes a little bit of craftiness in order to get to that inexpensive level. You have to have the good pantry, and then I recommend to everybody: pantry, no matter what your diet is, is really really important. Because if you've got good spices in the pantry, you've got good olive oils, you've got good healthy whole grains that you can turn to, um, some dried beans and legumes, and a lot of aromatics like other spices, like garlic, like onions. If you've got that stuff already, you've got it ready to go, then you can just add in some greens every week, some, some fresh things, um, and you'll have a really good, easy diet in no time. So that pantry probably would take people, if they, if they read this or they go on any of the resources online, two hours to build, you know, but it's setting you up for like a year of success in the kitchen. And um, I always tell people, you know, the pantry is the original medicine cabinet. Back in the day, people did not have medicines, they had the pantry. So now we can use the pantry to complement the medicines and people can really enjoy optimal health. That was a great question. Thank you. I'm ignorant about the kitchen, so I'm happy to ask questions. Follow up to that, do you have like a, uh, a handout on how to build a pantry, like the bachelor's guide to a pantry kind of thing, you know, sim sure. simple enough for an endocrinologist to understand? Oh, <laughs> I think you guys are capable of understanding much, much more than that. And we, and we have something in common, by the way, because I always wanted to be a doctor when I was a kid, but as I grew up, I realized that the sight of blood made me weak in the knees. So I said, well, I can cook for them and they'll still feel good, <laughs> but I don't have to look at blood. So uh, yeah, that's a very, very good question. Um, the the, the no-brainer guide, there is a mention here in, in this book about how to build a pantry. And the other resource would be on the Hormone uh, Health Network's website, which we did from last year in Boston. There's, there's a little section, you go to www.hormone.org, which is these guys' website. Then you click on resources for health professionals. Then you click on clicking, cooking for, sorry, click and cook are close. You click on cooking for pleasure and health resources for medical professionals, and you'll see me. And what we did last year was three PowerPoint presentations and downloadable, downloadable cheat sheets, and they're on there. So you'll get all of that material in there. And also in my third cookbook, which is the Mediterranean Diabetes Cookbook, there's the full nitty gritty of how to build a pantry. And it pretty much carries right over to acromegaly because there's a lot of similar symptoms with diabetes. That's a great question. Anyone else, questions? Yes, I'm glad you're here. You're like the audience advocate. I'm like Peppy. I keep standing up. So, so the last question is, do you have any of these kinds of recipes geared toward pediatrics mm -hmm. um, with a focus on the kinds of foods that kids will actually eat? Um, and or, or if not, are you developing those also for the website? Are you asking about kids with acromegaly or just no, kids in kid, general? We, we don't call it acromegaly. In kids, we call it gigantism. But I'm talking about mostly obese kids and diabetic kids, recipes for kids who have endocrine disorders. And the most common would be diabetes and obesity. Um, you know, and, and there's been lots of talk about portion control and eliminating, so there's a lot about what to take out, taking out the portions that are too large, taking out the sodas, uh, but not so much on how to make flavors that are appealing to children or textures or, or, or colors. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these uh, recipes are really 
oriented toward adults. So I just wonder if you could comment about that. Sure. The pediatric issue is really, really important because you know kids are more susceptible to the advertisements and to the to the you know fun foods that are are being so bad. So. Uh, I do do a lot of work with kids um, through a lot of different foundations. I'm also part of the Chefs Move to Schools uh, organization, which we go into schools and we actually work with them on growing their own gardens and creating healthy recipes in the school system. What you have to do with kids, regardless of the recipe, because the recipe is really not important, they're always going to want the little toys, they're always going to want the fun advertisements, and it's hard to, to be as cool as that. But what kids respond really well to is our time and our emotional commitment, and they can sense phonies, and they can sense when we're not into it and when we're trying to sell them something. So you have to really believe it to portray it to the kid. And I have a perfect example from that. One of the things uh, that I did in the schools that I go into, I had to teach third graders, and I had to work with whatever produce they had from their garden when at the time that I signed up. So I signed up for autumn. I live in Washington, D.C. So it was the time that they had kale and collard greens. And I said, okay, there's a bunch of us chefs, and they told me I had to work with the kale and collard greens. Okay, it was my first choice, but okay, for third graders. Um, what's the guy in front of me, and, and what's he going to do? Well, it's Bill Yosis, who's the White House pastry chef, and he's going to do pizza. <laughs> So I said, I'm going after the White House chef, and I'm doing uh, kale, and he gets to do pizza? Like, I mean, what you, the kids are going to throw stuff at me, you know? So I said, okay, I've really got to, like, up my game. You know, I've got to make it fun for these kids, and I've got to get them involved. So I said, well, what can I do to make them involved? Kids want our time. Kids want to learn. They want stories, and they want to be involved. So I said, okay, I'm going to give them a really cool story and the best tasting collards and and kale that I can. So I thought about what's the best tasting collards and kale that I've ever had. And they come from an Ethiopian restaurant. I don't know if you've, if you've ever been to an Ethiopian restaurant and had their collards, the Abish Goma, or um, kale from Ethiopia. It's f phenomenal. It, it really, it's like candy. So I said, okay, they use a lot of onions, they use a lot of uh, garlic, they use a lot of ginger and, and pepper, and that's how they make it. So I said, I'm going to do that with the kids. I'm going to make the Ethiopian style collars and kale, but I'm not just going to do it like that. I'm going to make a little PowerPoint about Ethiopia and tell them how cool Ethiopia is, where it is, I'll show them little kids like them, and what they're eating. And then I'm going to tell them, now you get the chance to participate in this too. First of all, can I tell you, their little eyes were crying because we had so many onions you know, piled up that it made them cry. But they, we had one mother in the class who was from Ethiopia, so she brought injera bread to participate. And we talked about, we got the whole cultural thing going, played Ethiopian music. Then we started cooking. The kids were so into it, they were begging for seconds. They were asking to bring it home for their parents because they never got to taste collard greens or kale and they put it on the school menu. So it's still part of that school menu. This is something I did like two years ago. So I can, what I'm trying to say is you can make even the least likely, the least romantic, uh, you know, popular ingredient accessible to kids if you just get them engaged. Stories are really important and history is important, culture is important. Uh, kids want to learn. And the other thing is uh, that I'm involved with is something called Martha's Table where uh, Target stores, sponsors, and gets a lot of leftover ingredients. They give them out to um, inner city areas that don't have a lot of resources. And needy parents will come and pick up these ingredients, take them back home uh, to use in their home kitchens. But a lot of times, the ingredients, the people don't know how to use the ingredients. Because in these urban areas, they don't have a lot of fresh produce. Uh, they'll have like a 7-Eleven, and they'll have to cook from there. People don't necessarily know how to deal with these ingredients. So what I do is I go and I volunteer, work with the kids, and then create recipes, easy recipes, how for the parents and the kids to use these ingredients so they can get more, more healthful things. And um, a lot of things on there for kids, but uh, even more than the recipes, I would say get them involved at an emotional level and, and get them learning because uh, you set them up for the future and you can, you can make them like an ingredient just with your story. Thank you. Yes. I have two questions. Uh, the first one is you were saying that uh, most of the foods can be freezed and they will be okay. Sure. Uh, are there any particular tips you would recommend in the whole process of actually freezing them in order to lose um, any of their taste afterwards sure. when you thaw them? And the second one is I was wondering if you have any particular thoughts on coconut oil? Mm -hmm. Any recipes? Sure. Uh, the question about freezing foods and the procedures for that, um, I will, I'll talk about that first. It's very, very easy. And it's more economical, and it's a time saver, and it's more healthful. Now, a lot of people don't like frozen foods in the health community because they say fresh foods are better. True. But frozen foods are the second best. And if you're going to be tempted to order out at, you know, um, I won't say it, but any, any 
fast food or pizza place because you don't have these ingredients on hand. But I'm going to tell you, you know, frozen broccoli and brown rice from your pantry is a lot better than ordering out from anywhere. That's just that's that's a no given. So you have to kind of see what fits into people's lifestyle. So frozen is definitely the second best. And one of the things we issue, deal with is time and money. So if you can get a big piece of salmon at a great price because it's on sale that week, get a whole bunch and freeze it and make sure that you can use it instead of saying, oh, this week I can't afford salmon because it's $20 a pound. You know, that, that's one of the things you can avoid by freezing. The other thing is you're saving your time. And in and, and my lifestyle, either whether it was dealing with illness or dealing with the busy schedule that I have now, I find that cooking a lot, uh, you know, two hours on a weekend day can set me up to have a really successful week. So if we're talking about the salmon, we've made a whole big side of salmon, say we've made a tray of chicken breasts and we made some other uh, turkey thighs maybe. We've done them all with our spice rub or with our shermoula sauce. Now we're going to get them frozen. Save enough out in your fridge so that you can eat for, say, three or four days comfortably. And then you can wrap these. Once they come to room temperature, so right now, we could put them into a container that has a tight-fitting lid, a plastic container, and just put them in your fridge, in, in your freezer. And that would stay for, like, a month. And then to be thought, all they have to do is take it out of the freezer, put it in the refrigerator, not on the counter, because the counter you can grow a lot of bacteria in those drastic temperature change. So you go from freezer to fridge, let it de-thaw. It takes maybe 12 to 24 hours and then it's ready to go. You just heat it up again and serve it. So that would be the, the, the second best uh, way that I recommend to serve things. The best things for... Um... No, I, I can tell you. Need some of this. Uh, the, the best things to, to uh, thaw and to freeze are soups and stews. Soups and stews freeze beautifully. Um, and, you know, they're great because you make them in that big pot, you make them in something like this, and then you put them into little individual frozen plastic things or even in Ziploc bags. You've got something easy to take to work with you. Uh, if, also, if you go on last year's web, the website from last year and download that free booklet just like this one, there's going to be all different recipes in there. There's a recipe for a um, orzo cannellini bean and tomato soup. It's really, really good. You don't even know that it's healthy for you. There's the, there's the Ethiopian kale recipe. There's some stews. So you can do those, freeze them. Um, and, and that's just a, a great, great way to go. I tell people, you know, always, always, whatever little time you spend in the kitchen, make the most out of it you possibly can because you're going to save time and money in the long run. Did that answer your question? Yes. There was one other question other than freezing. The coconut oil. Um, coconut oil is out there. A lot of people don't like coconut oil because they say it has saturated fats. But there have been a lot of studies done that prove that even though it has a lot of fat in it, that there are a lot of good properties in that fat and people should be using it. So there's a very thin line. Uh, I'm not a nutritionist, but in the world of nutritionists, there are um, coconut is the best and coconut is the worst. And there's two distinct schools. Um, so, you know. You, you know, you all have your own medical backgrounds and you can see I tend to side more with the holistic integrative approach because I think that none of us, um, some of us know a lot more than others about the way the body works, but still we're finding out new things every day because we're being involved with people from different places and we see that they're having different responses to food. We also can see that people with different ethnic backgrounds or kind of different DNAs do different things with different foods um, better. So I would say look at the patient. And, and see where do they come from in the world. Is this a place that coconut oil is prevalent? And um, do their ancestors use it? And if they do, put them in the school with people that can have it. And if they don't, to be to error on the safer side, put them in the school with people who shouldn't. Yes, sir. You mentioned packaging and freezing. And since you just said you're not a nutritionist, uh, you, this is for the greater audience. Sure. You know, when you put something in a plastic container, we're very concerned now about the endocrine disruptors, about chemical influences. Does anybody know any micro, truly microwavable plastics? <laughs> is there anything you could store? Ah, that's a good question. Is there anything you could store? I don't recommend a microwaving micro in the plastic. Very good point. Thank right you. Right across the board. No, I would, I would put anything. If you, if you frozen it and put it in your fridge, take it out, put it in here, um, cover it with a paper towel, not with plastic. And then, and then microwave. If you're microwaving, that's the best way to go. You, you really don't want to heat up the plastics. That's a very good point. Thank you for reminding me. I'm in total agreeance with that. We have so many things to think about. You know, you're already dealing with this illness that's got 30 different symptoms. And then you've got to talk about preventative things for the future and the new findings that are on the, on the TV right now. But luckily, you know, nature set us up really pretty well. So there are these things out there that are, that are good for us and that taste good and that people will like. Does anybody else have any questions? I'm free for the rest of the day, so please don't hold back if you do. 
This has been wonderful. I really appreciate all of your attendance. And I have cards up here. I have a website. It's amyriolo.com. You're welcome to go on there. I also have my own cooking channel, a video channel, making all kinds of recipes. That's at a website called monkeyc.com uh, forward slash A-S for Sophia. And then my last name, Riolo, R-I-O-L-O. -O. And these are uh, recipes that go on syndicated news channels all around the country. So you may see me on your local news doing a, a, a healthful turkey for Thanksgiving or something like that. But I, I'd love to hear from you and, and stay in touch. And if you have any specific issues that you feel need uh, addressed, please let me know and I'll start working. Thank you. <laughs>